pardon? Okay. So I'm going to go by and pick up mom and bring her to your place. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. So. Open recent. Strange. Do you have a jump drive? I have no idea what this is. Okay. It looks kind of like a jump drive. There's much to the time. I don't know what it is. Okay. For some reason. not letting me say it. She's never done that before. Hmm. I just copied some files at Arvo's over to this. Oh, hang on a second. Maybe it is. Hang on a second. Here we go. So I don't know what that jump drive is, if it was copy protected or something. Yeah. It may be doing it. Let's see. How's work going?
numbing. How do you, how do you, how do you run? Okay, I think it did it. Okay, it appears it's there. immune system. I'm going to run down to the restroom. I'll be right back.
thing. And to go through the internet that they're playing on stream, we had to go through here. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to see all of you to, uh, that have come to our dinner with the doctor. Optimal immunity, a very important subject for these days, isn't it? Um, I miss the fellowship that we used to have when we had our meals together, but hopefully one day soon we'll get back to that, where we can actually have a meal together and fellowship. Um, but we still do have a meal, except it's in sack lunch form. So when you leave the um, um, lecture tonight, there will be um, sack lunches on the table where you registered. So just grab one. They're all the same. Just grab one on your way out, OK? And we appreciate your donations also. I've noticed how all of you have been contributing, and we just really appreciate that to cover the cost of the food. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> I wonder um, if you have received several emails from me or from Healthy Happenings, and if you did, I apologize. <laughs> um, I, was, I was trying to, um, to to send them out and realize that I had made a mistake and then I had to resend. So if you got several from me, uh, I'm sorry about that. But are you receiving our emails? That's what I would really like to know. Can you raise your hands if you're receiving my, the emails? Okay, several of you. Um, the rest of you, how did you find out about the program? Newspaper. Newspaper. Okay, great. All right. If on the card, yes, the dinner with the doctor card. Okay. So if you would like to know about our uh, dinner with the doctor programs that we have once a quarter, basically, please leave your email address on the sign-in sheet. And if you haven't done so, we can, you can just go back. We'll leave them out there, and you can add that information. Speaking of our next dinner with the doctor, you got the little card. We have the date, but we're we're working on the speaker. So um, save the date, so it'll be a surprise. We'll send out that information as it becomes available, but at least we, we know what ne the next one will be. We're just not sure what our topic and our speaker is quite at this time. Um, the, what you're eating, to, what, what you're gonna be taking home tonight is uh, the Kenyan bean recipe on the yellow sheet of paper. I think you'll be delighted with its flavor. And um, if you have any questions about the recipe after you look over it, you can um, ask me questions later. Or, or if you have them now, you can ask them to me now. But it's a very simple recipe. It's very, very quick. And um, it's quite flavorful. The rice that you will it's on a bed of rice, and what you will have tonight is just not plain brown rice, but I have um, used basmati rice, I've used jasmine rice, and I've also used quinoa rice. So, I mean quinoa, not quinoa rice, just quinoa. And what I do is I just take a cup, because I usually make a cup at a time, but I just throw maybe a couple of tablespoons of quinoa on the bottom, and the rest I do rice. Um, anyway, that just gives you several options if you like, would like that. The restrooms that are in the building are directly to my right, both men and women, if you should, if you should need them. 
I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rhoda Kana. I am the Health Ministries leader here of the Greenville Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we like to plan health programs to um, share with our community, the Greenville community. And um, we are working on some other things. COVID has kind of um, helped us, forced us to rethink things, but anyway, we will be having future programs here. <clears throat> so our, like I said, our topic tonight is on optimal immunity. And I would like to introduce our speakers. Uh, Walt Cross is from the Mustard Seed in Newport, New, in Newport um, Tennessee. He's been there for approximately 17 years, I guess 17 years this week, last week, something like that. But Walt Cross is a graduate, uh, he went to Southern Adventist University and University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. He studied and got his degree in healthcare administration. And he worked in healthcare for 20 years. Following that, he became a director of a center that specialized in reversing diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease. Because he wanted to raise his family in Tennessee, he came back home, and that's when the mustard seed, uh, they acquired the mustard seed. And that ministry has been going on, like I said, for 17 years. Uh, Mr. Cross travels extensively across the United States to lecture. He goes to Canada. He's been to Africa, Venezuela, Bermuda. But he does a lot of work right here in uh, our area. He goes into the school system in Cock County and the, and the uh, Newport City school systems. He works in businesses in Cock County and Greene County and the Jefferson County, and he assists in churches. And what he does is he teaches healthy lifestyle. He does healthy lifestyle training. So we're delighted to have him. The mustard seed is a, um, they have a deli there. They have um, um, things you can buy, uh, supplements you could buy. And they have a, a ministry there that is well worth your time to go visit. I go there quite often to enjoy his wife's food, for sure. Um, then I'll tell you about Dr. Kana, who happens to be my husband. So he, I have this memorized. <laughs> um, so he graduated from Loma Linda Medical School in Loma Linda, California. He did two residencies, one in internal medicine and the other in neurology. And then he did a fellowship in neuroimaging. He has worked as a neurologist in various places and he is now working in Newport at the Tonova Medical Corporation. Even though he's a neurologist, his passion is to help people live healthy lifestyles. And so, he and uh, Walt Cross tonight will present our lecture together. But before they present, um, Pastor Jared Calloway, who is the associate pastor here at the Greenville um, Seventh-day Adventist Church, will have a short devotional and prayer. Well, welcome everyone. I may not know every single person here or the details of what brought you here tonight, but I'd venture to guess that the topic, optimal immunity and how to achieve it, had something to do with it. So tonight, I'm actually, I'm very excited to hear what our presenters have to say, but I also have a guess as to some of what they're going to talk about and I can say that there's a lot of different principles for 
achieving optimal immunity. There's exercise, water, nutrition, sunlight. There's different things. But as my job often um, allows me to do, I'll talk to you about what stands out as the most important. And that's our relationship or trust in God, our relationship with our Creator. Because we can have the, the proper exercise, we can have proper nutrition, we can do all the things right, but if we're not doing what we're put on this earth to do, how can we expect our lives to have the quality that follows from doing such? I once heard a pastor, uh, Doug Batchelor, say that the safest place in the world to be is in the center of God's will. And I wanted to share with you tonight just a promise from Scripture for those who are also in the center of God's will. If you turn with me in your Bibles, um, if you don't have one, they're there in the pew. If you have a Bible like this, it's just a black Bible. It's right in the middle of the Bible. It's the book of Psalms. And this is Psalm 91 on page 570 in these little black Bibles. This psalm gives a promise for those who follow God's will for their lives. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 91, verse 1, he says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings he shall, you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. This psalm, called the Psalm of Protection by many, is one that many soldiers take into battle with them. It's one that um, I carried with me whenever I was in Afghanistan myself, and it serves as a constant reminder no matter how perilous the times we live in, no matter how dangerous the next virus that comes, no matter what we're facing in this life, if we're doing what God put us here to do, whatever that may be, whatever your calling is, whatever your job is, if you're living your life in honor of what he's put you here for, in honor of what his son taught us, the safest place in the world to be is in the center of God's will. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you for your protection in our lives. We praise you for the trust that we can have, that whatever you have prepared for us, that you will continue to watch over us all. We pray you be with our speakers and we ask that you open our ears and especially open our hearts so that the principles we learn tonight, and of course the most important principle, to know you better, 
may seep into our hearts, may strengthen our immune system so that we can live our lives in honor of you and what you put us here to do. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. I forgot I was using a mic here. Um, how many of you are healthcare professionals? Okay, quite a few. This lecture is uh, somewhat outside of standard medicine because, as you know, when we were dealing with this COVID-19 crisis, there were many months where we were told to go home and if we got sicker, go to the hospital. So this is intended to fill in that gap, not with all the perfect studies you can imagine because they don't all exist, but they are designed, these things we're gonna talk about are designed to help you to survive. The Lord has given us many good things in nature as well as habits and the laws of health. And if we follow those, we reap the benefits. So let's begin. This evening we're looking at optimal immunity, how to achieve it. And I apologize, I was hoping to have my screen so I could look here, but it didn't work so we can, um, we can uh, stream out. So we'll have to look at this some. We're gonna look at several things this evening. What is the immune system? What well, things not to do, things to do, and things to take. So we're gonna look at those four items this evening. So first of all, we're gonna look at what is the immune system. Okay, we have a system that is designed to tell self from non-self. And the Lord made us that way. You can see in this diagram the, the enemy there, the virus, SARS-CoV-2, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, and that's what causes COVID-19 and susceptible people. COVID-19 is obviously the disease, not the virus. So this little diagram, which is gotten from a virology website, shows you that there is an enemy and you see those red um, um, particles on the outside of the virus, those are the spike proteins. And that's how the virus attaches to your cells. So let's say you had the virus before, or maybe you got a vaccination. Those green particles are designed to coat the entire virus. The virus is a sphere, it's not a circle. And that will protect you from that virus particle. It can't attach to your cell receptors there on the bottom in silver and gray. So that's how the specific um, immune system works, the acquired immunity. Let's go on to the next slide. <coughs> So what are the types of immunity? There are two main types. You can see the cells that are diagrammed here for the uh, innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So the innate immune system is what we're really focusing on tonight. We're trying to find ways, trying to show you ways to help the immune system work better by dealing with any pathogen that comes along, any virus or bacterium that comes along, because that's what that innate immune system is designed to do, and that's what's good in young people. They can protect themselves against any threat. Now, you'll notice 
If you can see well enough that there are two shades to this uh, diagram, there's a lighter shade on the left and a darker shade on the right, and right in the lower part, there's an area that comes out to the right for this lower, sh lighter shade called the natural killer cell. And that's uh, one of the things that's been important for innate immunity, and we have ways that have been documented to improve natural killer cell function. So the natural killer cell goes to the infected cells in your body and kills them because they are, infec they are infected and they're producing more virus in the case of COVID-19. The adaptive immune system is what happens when you've had some infection before, you've seen it before, and so your, your body can respond to it because it has memory cells that are designed to produce antibodies when, ne when needed and T memory cells too, not just B cells. B cells produce antibodies, T cells help with the immune response. And so although in COVID-19 we've been seeing that antibodies don't last very long, maybe six months, maybe a year, we don't know, there are T cells that last longer and they have a memory of that infection so you can fight the infection with more than just antibodies, you can wake up some T cells and they will promote an immune response again. So the vaccines are designed to take advantage of the adaptive or the acquired immune system. And so you'll have antibodies for the virus when it, uh, you come in contact with it. Next slide. This is a diagram which I guess you can't read, but on the left upper corner it says each B cell has different antigen receptors. So each of your B cells is designed to be specific for a certain type of um, threat. And you can see the green antigen receptor on the upper left. This antigen receptor of one B cell will combine with one antigen, so they're quite specific. An antigen is a foreign protein to your uh, body. In the presence of cytokines, this B cell will be stimulated to divide. And you can see on the bottom, cytokines, and, and these come from T cells. So the T, the T cells produce these chemicals that say, wake up, pay attention, something's going on, there's a threat. And then the B cells, they're appropriate, uh, wake up. So let's say the uh, virus comes, it attaches to your cells, it gets in your cells, and then the certain proteins from the virus are expressed, we call it, they, they're, they're stuck right on the outside of your immune cells. And the immune cell says, hey, this is the threat, this is what's going on. And so there are certain T cells which make responses, and the cytokines help the T cells and the B cells to get all excited, and so we have a specific uh, group of antibodies produced against this threat. And the immune system doesn't recognize you like Walt here, you know, he's got a mustache, his hair is a certain color, his ears are a certain size, he's a certain height. That's not how the immune system recognizes you. It may recognize an ear or a nose or an eye. So there are different parts that are recognized. And then your antibodies are produced accordingly. So you don't just have one antibody for one bug. So anyway, this happens and then the B cells produce lots and lots of antibodies, and you can see that's called clonal expansion. A clone, you know, a clone is like if there were a hundred of me, perish the thought. But that's what happens, you get all the same thing. And you get memory B cells produced, which are for later, so that you will recognize this infection again if you've had it. And then the plasma cells are what produce the antibodies. So I'll leave it at that, that's enough of the, this stuff. But just so you get the general idea of what type of immunity we're talking about mainly, innate immunity? Things not to do, and many times we look at reactive when we look in healthcare. Someone falls off a ladder and you address them, and, and so you, you deal with the, um, the broken leg or whatever. We'd like to look tonight more as a proactive. Can we do something proactively to build the immune system? I'm a fire chief. And tonight my guys are, are practicing, and if we, you know, let's say we have a wreck on I-40, and we have a bad crash, and we've got to peel the vehicle apart, it's not the time to pull out the manual and try to figure out how to use Jaws Alive. Those guys practice ahead of time so they know how to use Jaws Alive. 
or if we have a hazmat, they know what to do in the event that we do have a, a wreck on Bluffton Curve and we're spilling some hazardous material so that we, we, we're proactive. And that's what we'd like to do tonight is look at how we can be proactive. An example, the United States Surgeon General looked at heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. And they looked to see, is there anything proactively we can do to address these diseases? And here's what the Surgeon General said. Here's what they found. Dietary excess and imbalance cause as much disease and death. What's the problem? Dietary excess and imbalance. And the problem is, it's not just excess, but folks, they don't eat a, a wide spectrum of nutrients. They eat same old, same old, same thing all the time. And a lot of times it's, it's processed. There's a lot of, not of nutrition, a lot of nutrition in there, so it's calorie dense. Diet has a vital influence on health. <clears throat> Five of the top 10 killers are directly related to diet. This includes heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. So the Surgeon General said, is there something that's causing it? And if so, what can we do to proactively address these diseases or address them? It is clear that diet contributes in substantial ways to the development of these diseases, according to the Surgeon General, and that modification of diet can contribute to their prevention and control, and I find, I find that's very interesting. Can we prevent those diseases? Absolutely, if we are proactive, and that's what we're talking about tonight, is can we be proactive with our immune system? So how do we weaken our immune system? There's things that will take out our immune system. Number one, I call them the three big S's. Number one is sugar, two is stress, and three is sleep deprivation on sugar. Besides bringing, uh, being a, dr uh, a, a driver behind other cr uh, chromatic health conditions like diabetes and heart disease, sugar consumption affects one's body's ability to fight off viruses or other infections in the body. <clears throat> White blood cells, also known as killer cells, are highly affected by sugar consumption. Sugar hin hinders the immune system by not allowing the white blood cells to do their job and destroy bacteria or viruses, as well as uh, when we do not eat sugar. And here's a, um, something out of Dr. Neil Nedley's book, Sugar Weakens the White Blood Cell's Ability to Destroy Bacteria. And we look at, at sugar, this is as, uh, if it's the Southern D uh, California Dental Association, they look at uh, if you don't eat any sugar for 12 hours, here's what happens to your, your uh, how many bacteria are destroyed. You've got zero is 14, six, 10, as you see it, it dropping. And so the more sugar you eat, the less uh, bacteria are destroyed by the white cells. The average American eats approximately 22 teaspoons of sugar each day, 150 pounds of sugar each year, and look at this one, 79 pounds of high fructose corn syrup each year. That's the average American. You know, if you look on YouTube, you can find videos of white cells chasing bacteria to gobble them up. They have to have a high energy system. <coughs> and they use nasty chemicals to kill things. That's why you need antioxidants in your diet. And so when you have enough of those antioxidants, you can mop up those nasty chemicals that have been used to kill uh, foreign agents like bacteria, viruses, or fungus, and then you don't damage the rest of your tissues. To give you a quick illustration, if you have a 12-ounce soft drink, that's going to lower your immune system 50% for the next approximately four hours, according to Dr. Nedley's book, Proof Positive. Now, if you add a little Snickers bar, now I'm not talking Snickers bar today, I'm talking little Snickers bar when we were kids. If you take, according to Dr. Nedley's research, if you take a 12-ounce soft drink and a small little candy bar, you're going to lower your immune system over the next four, four hours. Only one out of 14 white cells is going to do its job. 13 have been anesthetized. He also found that just a, an average milkshake or a slice of cheesecake. How many of y'all like cheesecake? Just a slice of cheesecake or your average milkshake wipes out your immune system, according to Nedley's work, 92 to 93% for the next four hours. So sugar has a huge impact on your immune system. Just to give you an idea of the amount of sugar 
Dr. Pepper's, Gatorade. Did you know Gatorade's got sugar in it? Got a mess of sugar in it. This is sugar in the, in the actual item, sugars per day, uh, and uh, sugar per year on the average of what folks are doing here. Next one, sleep deprivation. Anybody have a problem with sleep? It's huge out there today, huge. Sleep provides essential support to the immune system. Getting sufficient hours of high quality sleep enables well-balanced immune defense that features strong, innate, and adaptive uh, immunity and less severe uh, allergic reactions. Lack of sleep can affect your immune system. Studies show that people who do not get quality sleep or enough sleep are more likely to get sick after being exposed to a virus, such as a common cold virus. Lack of sleep can also affect how fast you recover if you do, not, uh, if you do get sick. Harvard, I just read something out of Harvard just recently. Harvard said that sleep deprivation wipes out your immune system. They're finding as much as stress. Anything on sleep? We'll, we'll comment on that later. How about stress? Anybody got stress? Stress is considered the number one diagnosis in America. I was listening just recently, and WHO is, is predicting that depression soon will be the number one diagnosis in the United States, surpassing stress. Many of today's illnesses and diseases are triggered by chronic stress. That's the problem, chronic stress, not acute stress. Uh, which we won't get into the physiology tonight, uh, which depresses the immune system and weakens havoc on every organ uh, system in the body. Exactly how stress causes contri uh, and contributes to disease is a question of particular interest to researchers. There are two likely pathways. One is behavioral. People under stress sleep poorly and are less likely to exercise. They adapt uh, poor eating habits smoke more, don't comply with medical treatment. Stress also triggers a response by the body's endocrine system, which releases hormones that influence multiple other biological systems, including the immune system. You know, when you have lost sleep, you're under stress. And your steroid hormones, your cortisol, which is like cortisone, is released in the morning at the highest level of the day, generally helps you get up in the morning. So when you're under stress, your cortisol levels stay higher, which suppresses the immune system and also makes you have insulin resistance. And you know diabetics have insulin resistance and they are more susceptible to infection and certain cancers. So this uh, stress response is important to control because it directly affects your immune system and the tendency for uh, even lifestyle diseases like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. And it also makes it harder to lose weight if your cortisol levels are higher. Yes. Now, can you compare this one to stress force? Pardon me? If you can read that one and compare, does that have any correlation with what happens also with stress? It's kind of hard to read there. One minute of anger can suppress your immune system for six hours. Um, Dr. Nedley mentioned a study of pregnant women that showed if they were thinking of a very unpleasant experience in their life uh, before they got their vaccine, they had a much lower immune response to the vaccine than those who had happy thoughts before their vaccine, which sounds a little strange, but it, it's probably through these immune effects uh, based on the endocrine system, the hormone system. Yes, Harvard did a study a few years ago on women, and they were looking at the correlation between how long after a woman they identified there might be a, a uh, breast cancer, whether it was uh, uh, something from imaging or something from uh, doing a biopsy. And the period of time that went from that biopsy to when they got the information and came up with a plan, it was called the period of unknown. And they found that period of unknown has significant stress and the, the woman's body to, to heal significantly dumped. And Harvard was pleading with physicians across the United States, don't wait so long in that period of unknown. Don't wait for that, that, that uh, lab from the 
pathology lab to come back and then wait till you can schedule time to talk to them, set up something with oncology, it's got to be rapid because it wipes out their, their ability to heal. Okay, things not to do. We looked at sugar, sleep deprivation, and stress. What about poor diet, vitamin D deficiency, alcohol, obesity, smoking, dehydration, and internet addiction? A very interesting. We'll look at some of these here. Uh, poor diet. Diets that are limited in variety and lower in nutrients, such as consisting primarily of uh, ultra-processed foods, can negatively affect the healthy immune system. It is also believed that the, a Western diet high in refined sugar and red meat and low in fruits and vegetables can pro promote disturbances in healthy intestinal microorganisms, resulting in chronic inflammation of the gut and associated suppressed immunity. That's a big topic. Yeah, that's a, that's a big topic. <laughs> you know, we're going to see more and more on this issue. MIT is doing some amazing research in this area. Harvard's doing some really good in research. We're going to see a lot more coming out of this area. Uh, anything on diet you want to cover? How it wipes out the immune system? Later. Got gotcha. you. Vitamin D deficiency. Deficiency in vitamin D is associated with increased autoimmunity uh, and an increased susceptibility to infection. There's definitely a direct relationship with your vitamin D level and your, um, your immune system. And many times people think it is, well, I'm fine, I'm taking 5,000 milligrams of vitamin D a day. It's not how much vitamin D you take a day. It's what is your blood level of vitamin D. And I've seen where a, folk, a person can have a vitamin D level of 12 and be taking 5,000 mil I use a vitamin D a day and then go to 5,000 twice a day and jump up to say 17 and then take 20,000 twice a day and only go to 24 and the problem is they didn't have magnesium and as soon as they had magnesium their vitamin D jumped significantly and so it's just not how much you take a day it's what is the blood level you want to take a look at Research shows that vitamin D plays an important role in immune function and, and a deficiency in it is shown to increase one's susceptibility to infection. Vitamin D deficiency can mean your immune system is more vulnerable. Some of the alternative medicine doctors are talking about uh, things getting through your gut wall because of inflammation. And there are some research studies that show that vitamin D helps to maintain the tight junctions between your gut cells, the lining of your colon and your small intestine, so that they're not leaky. That's just one mechanism of keeping your gut lining healthy, is having an adequate vitamin D level. Sorry, that jumped on us there. Um, Low levels of vitamin D have also been associated with frequent infections. In 2009, the National Institute of Health warned that low vitamin D levels are associated with frequent colds and influenza. And you're noticing one of the items that they're recommending today is adequate vitamin D level. Uh, we're told there's a silver Lexus with the engine on and the lights on outside. And I guess you're saying there's no one inside? <laughs> okay. So if it's your vehicle, you know. So again, we're looking at proactive things. What we, can we do to keep our immune system up so that when we are introduced with, with some type of pathogen, what can our body do to, to ward that away? A good vitamin D level is very, very important. Alcohol. Alcohol compromises the body's immune system and increases the risk of adverse health outcomes, WHO. Alcohol can trigger inflammation in the gut and destroy the microorganisms that live in the intestine and maintain immune system health. It's interesting, and this is from PubMed, and as you were saying, as we look at immune system, we're seeing, a, you know, we're seeing more and more information. What's going on in the gut can affect the immune system, and I believe we'll see a lot more out there at, as we go on. Obesity. Obesity, like other states of malnutrition, is known to impair the immune function, altering leukocyte counts as well as cell uh, 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 mediated immune responses. This is Cambridge University. 
How about smoking? Smoking harms the immune system and can make the body less successful in fighting the disease. How about dehydration? Can that affect anybody dehydrated? You know, I work with folks that say, oh, I just don't like water. Significant positive correlation were, correlations were found between severity of dehydration and changing ratios of IgA, IgG, IgM, C3, C4, and ROS production capabilities, whereas no significant association was seen with PA and other serum SOD activity. These results suggest that dehydration results in immune, uh, immunosuppression include uh, decreased uh, neuro, uh, neutrophil function. Those things that were listed were immunoglobulins, the uh, things that make antibodies, or antibodies are made out of, and ROS is reactive oxygen species. So you can kill things with reactive oxygen species because they are oxygen um, atoms that are unstable, or oxygen molecules that are unstable, depending on the type of molecule you have. And that's why you need antioxidants. So if you have pro-oxidant function, then your white cells that kill things that they ingest, then you need antioxidant function as well. Now, those reactive oxygen species are very important in COVID-19. And that's why we found out we need to treat them with steroids to settle everything down. Because when your immune system is all revved up, it can cause a lot of damage especially when the enemy's already gone. So uh, just, I wanted you to know what ROS is. Now you may say, Walt, you're talking about dehydration. Why do you have a picture of Pepsi up there? I had a man come see me last week and he had some health issues and I encouraged him to be well hydrated. And he said, I'm well hydrated. He says, I drink plenty of Pepsi every day to hydrate me. And I said, sir, do you drink water? And his wife's going, I said, sir, your body requires water to perform the functions that it needs, not Pepsi. He said, well, I drink Pepsi. So I don't think it did any good. Not only was it not drinking water, but what was the other problem with drinking Pepsi? It's a caffeine, it's a diuretic, plus all the other problems with Pepsi. Internet addiction, do y'all see that today? I think COVID has exacerbated that. Internet addiction can damage immune function. People with excessive internet use have 30% more cold and flu symptoms than those with less problematic internet usage. Those who spend excessive time on the internet tend to have greater sleep deprivation, worse eating habits and less healthy diets, uh, engage in less exercise, tend to smoke and drink alcohol more not to talk about drugs. Yeah. So with things not to do, sugar, sleep deprivation, stress, poor diet, vitamin D deficiency, alcohol, obesity, smoking, dehydration, internet addiction, those are just a few things proactively if you can get a hold of, then your body's a lot stronger. Look at things to do. Where's the pastor? I think he's already talked about one of them. I find these uh, psalms very helpful. I'm sure many of you know them. Now, Psalm 103 talks about all our blessings. It's got uh, 22 verses well worth your memorization. We can talk until the cows come home on things to do, but I promise you not one of them will heal. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're talking about a medication. If you're talking about echinacea, they don't heal. Only God does the healing. And you ask God to bless those just as you do. You sit down and eat. But the most important is trusting in God. WHO, what did they say? Wash your hands regularly. Soap and water. Alcohol rub, uh, if not visibly dirty. 
And it's interesting, different pathogens, as I read, some things water and soap kill better and some things alcohol kills better. Practice respiratory hygiene. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing. Throw the tissue into the closed bin. Hand washing. You know, we think back when we were kids, Arvo, what did our dads and our granddads give us when we had a little snotty nose? They'd pull out their hanky that they'd rub their nose on and all the other kids' <laughs> nose on. Fortunately, we've thrown them things away. Maintain social distancing, especially if coughing or fever, at least two meters. It's interesting. In, anybody know what WHO was recommending in March? One meter. They've extended it to two meters. You know, they, you know why they got this, right? Because when you talk and when you, not sneezing, but communicating with people, those large particles that come out of your mouth tend to drop fairly quickly. So that's the reason for the two meter distance. But when you sneeze, it's a different story. Or when you're singing, it may be a different story. But that's supposedly the reason for the distance, as you probably know. Avoid touching your eyes, mouth, and nose. Can you explain why that is? The uh, viruses tend to get in through your nose or mouth often, and specifically the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 um, has ACE2 receptors, those, those things on the outside of the coronavirus will attach to the ACE2 receptor, and those are located in the lining of your nose your upper respiratory tract, and your lungs. And there are other areas, too, like in your gut. So those explain some of the symptoms, and they also explain how the virus gains entry. So what I tell people is, if you have someone sick at home, you know about the respiratory precautions, but when you drink water, when you eat, when you brush your teeth, whatever you do that gets uh, skin or your hands, involved with your nose or mouth. If you wash your nose and around your mouth first, then you will get rid of some of those germs and then you won't push them into your nose or mouth uh, when you're eating or drinking. Masks and personal protective equipment if you're sick, when you're caring for someone else who is sick in a healthcare setting. If you are unwell, stay home. If you have a fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, seek early medical care. World Health Organization, 2020. Um, I wasn't expecting this slide here, but this is what Dr. Schwelt recommended in a recent lecture, 10 things to do if you get COVID-19 or to help prevent it. So I'll go over these quickly monitoring and medications. He says if you get a pulse oximeter, you will know whether you're starting to have some danger. Because in COVID-19, for some reason, we can start to get low oxygen levels and not know it at first. And then monoclonal antibodies. Um, if you know you're getting sick and you have risk factors like diabetes or hypertension or obesity, you can go to the hospital if you present within three days, even here at the Ballot Health Hospitals, and get monoclonal antibodies just like President Trump did so that they will inactivate the virus and so you will survive better. Vitamins we will talk about, vitamin D and acetylcysteine, which helps uh, the body's most important intracellular antioxidant, glutathione, be replenished. NAC is an amino acid. Sleep, which helps your natural killer cells and immune system in general to work better. Hyperthermia, which is uh, saunas, hot showers, uh, that sort of thing, helps your immune system to be boosted. And then preventing spread at home, Dr. Schwelt talks about in his videos. You can look them up on medcram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M dot com. And some of you have heard this before, but if you keep a window open when someone's sick, you allow the air to circulate more. You don't want someone who's coughing to suspend all the viral particles in their respiratory tiny secretions, like 5 to 10 microns. You don't want them suspended through the air, just hanging there for hours. You want the air to circulate. 
So that's why buildings like this may have an ionizer where it gets particles out of the air to prevent them from continuing to circulate. So that's filtration. Uh, you can buy filters for your house. You can put a HEPA filter in your house. And then isolating the person who's sick is important because then you're less likely to get the rest of the inhabitants of the house sick. Here are things to do. A healthy diet, a balanced diet, consisting of a range of vitamins and minerals mostly effect, most effectively primes the body to fight infection and disease, Harvard School of Public Health. And one of the things, it's got to be variety. As we look at nutrients, you don't want, say, again, same old, same old. You want an orchestra of, nutri of nutrients. Eating enough nutrients is part of a, is, I'm sorry, eat enough nutrients as part of a varied diet is required for the health and function of all cells, including immune cells. You want those fruits, you want those veggies, you want those nuts and seeds, those grains, so important for uh, our immune system, to be, for our bodies to be, uh, to be healthy. You know, the Lord made a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, so if you don't like um, beets or you don't like oranges, you can eat something else. But each fruit and vegetable and grain and nut and seed and bean has its own specific benefit. And they're all a little bit unique, although many are in different classes of foods, and they all provide a certain amount of food that's necessary for you to function right. Another thing to do is hydrotherapy, and you spoke a little there. There's different types of uh, hydrotherapy. One is a cold shower. I can tell when Mary Lou's finished with her shower in the morning because she starts a hollering. Uh, she turns it plum cold, and we live up in the mountains, and we've got a spring, and it's cold in the wintertime. Uh, but uh, cold water increases the white cells. And here's a bunch of benefits here. Just take a cold shower. A sauna, saunas are very good uh, for building the immune system. Uh, and you can actually go um, take a shower, go a sauna, come back, take a shower, then go down to cold for 30 seconds, get back in the sauna and go back and forth, back and forth, and it significantly will increase the immune system. There's, these are your new ones. There's, a, there's some of your old saunas of years ago. It's not something new. Fever treatments. I read about fever treatments from a fellow at Loma Linda Medical School. He said it would increase the white count sevenfold. I didn't believe it. So I had our nurses draw labs on our patients that we did fever treatments. Beginning of the treatment, at the end of the treatment, after we poured the ice water down the back of their neck, and then every half hour for six hours. He was exactly right. It peaked at sevenfold at five hours consistently on every one of the patients we drew those labs on. Um, I didn't go past six hours. Uh, because we saw it stabilized there, and I wanted a lot of volume. Uh, but Harold Cherney did research on, on how long it goes, and he found it did not come back to normal until three days later. I don't know how that bell curve went. Uh, fever treatments, and, uh, military used to use fever treatments uh, years ago. And the, part of the fever treatment is you also want to uh, have that person lay in a, in a bed covered up for two hours after the treatment. But very, very successful and increasing the white cells to build the immune system. This, this rest after your uh, fever or your hydrothermal therapy is important to allow the energy of the body to go into the immune uh, system function. And if you don't do that, you don't get the benefits nearly as much. So it's really important to rest if you can, especially if you do a prolonged treatment like he said, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. You get tired. And that's a sign you need to go to bed and, and relax and stay warm. And uh, your immune system does its magic then, just as the Lord intended uh, for those white cells and other things to work. And, and it's very helpful also if you're tired to go rest when you feel like you need it, if at all possible, because that may prevent you from getting sick. How many of y'all have grown up on a farm or, or uh, had uh, horses? So y'all know about fomentations on horses. Uh, fomentations are very effective. Uh, here we have a lady doing a fomentation on the child and uh, where you put a hot fomentation there 
Uh, you can do a revulsive treatment where you take the, you do the hot for three minutes, take it off, do cold for one minute or, or a 30 second cold mitten friction with, with ice water, and then go back to the hot contrast, hot, cold, hot, cold, extremely good for respiratory issues, uh, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's uh, influenza, very, very effective. This is a Youngberg Clinic using hot and cold contrast showers, bathing, or fomentations can powerfully optimize immune function and greatly stimulate antibody production against viral and other forms of infection. Let me just tell you this story. In, um, in 1918, there was when the flu influenza came through, it hit Chattanooga and hit Collegedale. And there's a college down there that most, a lot of us went to school there. And uh, in the fall of, of 1918, there was 13 inches of snow. That's unusual there in Collegedale to have 13 inches of snow in the fall. And the influenza hit. They just had a, a male nurse that came, was graduated from Hinsdale College. And he came and he started doing hot and cold fomentations on the, um, on the students that had the Spanish flu. Not one student died for the, from the Spanish flu. And then there was a college over in uh, Alabama and, uh, uh, called Oakwood College. And their students got the influenza. And they went and, and um, started treating those patients with these fomentations. Not one of those students died. Went back, to, by that time we had a second wave and it hit, uh, in, uh, in, at 19, it hit College Dell again. You know, we're seeing waves now with this one. We're, they saw waves in, also back in, in the Spanish flu. It hit College Dell again. Not one of the students died. Um, the, at this time, the male nurse, he got it. His assistant got it at the same time. The only person who died between the two schools was the assistant, uh, where the nurse wasn't able to treat him. But very, very effective. So as things to do, uh, we look at prayer, we look at uh, the recommendations there from WHO, uh, a healthy diet, hydrotherapy. But the question that y'all wanna know is there things that we can take? But let me warn you, let me warn you. You can do any one of these things, all of these things. If you don't get your sleep, if you eat a bunch of sugar and you can't control stress, you're wasting your time here because I've seen people do these, many of these, and they don't get their sleep, they have major stress, or they're eating sugar, and it just totally undoes this. So that's why we wanna talk about that proactive issue. So vitamin D, vitamin D helps our immune system stay balanced during the cold and flu season and serve as a pharmacy resource. There are vitamin D receptors and, actively in, and activating enzymes on the surface of all white blood cells. The role of vit that vitamin D plays in keeping the immune system healthy is very complex because the immune system has to be perfectly balanced. If there is too much stimulation, autoimmune disease can set in. If there is not enough immune system activity, frequent infection can occur. Anything on vitamin D? Um, I mentioned MedCram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M, uh, MedCram.com. Dr. Schwelt, Roger Schwelt, a pulmonologist, critical care specialist, sleep specialist, internist, has uh, chronicled the progress of medicine and natural remedies since March of last year. And he has a bunch of COVID-19 lectures. And you can see them. And he does have a lecture on vitamin D. An interesting thing I hadn't heard is that vitamin D is of course produced by sunlight acting on cholesterol in your skin by ultraviolet type B, short wavelength. And so that's why it's important to be out in the midday. Um, if you can't get that, then you take supplements. But even if you take supplements, if there are certain components of your diet that are not proper, you may have some trouble getting your vitamin D to work. The liver puts a hydroxy group an OH on the vitamin D at a certain position. And then the kidney 
can put another OH at a different position. It's called 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. That's the active vitamin D. But there's a 24 position that can be, have it, a hydroxy put on it. And that inactivates the vitamin D. And that is promoted by high fructose corn syrup. And Dr. Schwalt quotes a study. I can't tell you off the top of my head. You can look on MedCram yourself for a lecture on vitamin D. But that's an interesting point that shows, as Walt said, that what you do needs to be a totality of healthy habits. Otherwise, some will negate others. And again, there, and I learned this from a physician down in Atlanta. And she said, it is not how much vitamin D you take a day. She says, what is your blood level? And yes, we know normal blood level is 30 to 100. A lot of the docs out there, they do more lifestyle or wanting maybe 50 at least. But um, she says, it is not what you take a day, what is your blood level? By the way, many of your doctors will tell you that a level of 30 is okay. And that does help bone formation, bone function to be good. But Dr. Bredesen, which is an Alzheimer's expert, um, suggests the preponderance of research suggests a vitamin D level of 50 is better for your brain function. Because the vitamin D receptors are all over your body and brain. The uh, MS uh, community, of which I have to treat also, the uh, multiple sclerosis patients are supposed to have a vitamin D level over 60. So you think, well, should mine be 30 or 60? Well, probably closer to 60 or 50. So you have to get your level checked to know if yours is adequate. Let me give a little ad. Next Friday, you can go just to the office above Dr. Conna's office there in Newport. Uh, Dr. Conway will be doing lab work. You just go in, get the lab, don't have to see him. His office does this once a quarter. And if you want to know why, what your vitamin D level is, you can go in there and get it, and they'll mail it to you. Uh, and then they can you know, let you know if there's an issue. But uh, find out what your vitamin D level is. Now, I was in Africa last year, and I was there, and a physician, he was talking to the black folks. He's a black fellow himself. And he said, y'all, he says, we have sunglasses on our skin. Walt does not. He says it takes six times more sunshine for our skin than it does Walt, this fellow was a professor at the medical school in Tallahassee in uh, Florida, and he said, depending on the, the darkness of the pigmentation of the skin, you need even more exposure to sunshine. Garlic, that's a cup of allison there. Allison is an effective ingredient in garlic that has antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, and antiprotozoal activity. This is from NIH. That took a lot of garlic to make that right there. <laughs> Allison exhibits various biological properties like antimicrobial, anti-cancer, antioxidant, immunomodulatory, uh, anti-inflammatory, hypoglycemic, and cardiovascular effects. It takes 24 cloves of garlic to make one drop of Allison. Garlic appears to enhance the functioning of the immune system by stimulating certain cell types, such as macrophage, uh, lymphocyte, lymphocytic, natural killer cells, NK cells, uh, dendritic cells, and eosinophilic, uh, eosinophils, eosinophils uh, by mechanisms including modulating the cytokine secretion, immune. Yeah. Immunoma uh, uh, globulin production, uh, phagocytosis, and uh, macrophage uh, activity activation. Again, the way, from uh, NIH. These yes, cells, you. these cells listed: macrophages, lymphocytes, natural killer cells, dendritic cells. Those are kind of like immune cells that have their own niche, and so dendritic cells will help present foreign proteins to your immune system to help uh, form antibodies. And each of these cells has its own function. They don't work by themselves. They're all like a team. So you need them to uh, be stimulated by cytokine secretion. You've heard of inter interferon, right? There are some people who don't have normal production of interferon. 
And uh, those are the kinds of people who get overwhelming in, uh, disease from COVID-19, for example. They don't produce enough interferon at first. The virus gets going and overwhelms the body. And finally, the body overcomes it, but then it's too late because the response is killing the patient. So these cytokines need to be produced at the right time. Now, the virus does decrease your, your um, immune system function to some degree. So that's why you need as many uh, things to help you as you can. Because if you're already compromised and the virus uh, depresses your immune system further by these specific mechanisms, then you could be in trouble. And phagocytosis, of course, phago is eat. So your phagocytes are the white blood cells that eat things that you don't want to be there. And as Walt was saying in the sugar diagram, the more bacteria your white blood cells can ingest for each white cell, the better. And so phagocytosis is just part of the immune function. Macrophage activation is what helps your immune system take something that's foreign and present the proteins on the outside of the cell to tell the body, hey, this is the enemy. Do something about it. And so these all have their own uh, story, even though that's a big paragraph that's hard to understand. Who likes garlic? Just add it to your food. And if you can't do it raw, just steam it for one or two minutes and eat maybe four of them each meal. Onions. Onions. Allium uh, septa is, a, uh, is an immune boosting food rich in uh, fructans, which is a type of fructose. Yes. Fried onions. See, that's our problem. We fry everything. Maters, taters, ice cream, pickles, pigs, chickens. <laughs> but it's, it's better to, it would be better to saute it in water than it would be fried in oil. Uh, but raw, your question would be raw, which is better? Definitely raw wood. Uh, def on the onions. We had a physician one time, he wanted all of our patients to eat four raw garlics each meal. That lasted about one meal. <laughs> and um, so we, we convinced him that if we'd stain it just one minute, maybe two at the most, at least they're getting some. Uh, so, uh, but the more raw, the, the more nutrient you're going to have there. You know, those, those smelly compounds in garlic and onion have a specific function. Your glutathione has these sulfur molecules, sulfur atoms in the molecule, and these sulfur compounds that are so smelly are helpful for your immune system because they do help things, not just your immune system, but your glutathione function. Those sulfur atoms take nasty chemicals and deactivate them so they don't hurt your body. They're, good, they're very good anti-cancer chemicals, too. This is one of my favorites. Uh, if I, I'm non-combatant, but if I had a gun on my side, this would be my 44 Magnum. It's amazing of what it does to boost the immune system, and that's oil of oregano. Oregano, oregano oil is a powerful plant-derived essential oil that may rival antibiotics when it comes to treating or preventing various infections. That's the Journal of Medical Foods. Oregano oil contains properties that are antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. Do you have something on oil of oregano? No, just personal experience. It, it's powerful. We use, my wife and I use a cocktail of things when you get sick, and it really helps a lot. And that includes oil of oregano, even though it smells kind of nasty. Zinc, we've heard a lot about zinc lately. Zinc is a mineral that's important to the bodies in many ways. Zinc keeps the immune system strong, helps heal wounds, and supports normal growth. These are some of the foods that you can get zinc from. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you know why zinc is important in fighting uh, infections, especially viruses. It's supposed to uh, 
You know, when the virus attaches to the cell, it injects its RNA, in the case of uh, coronavirus, and it uses the shell, cell machinery. It hijacks the cell machinery to produce the viral proteins that make more viruses. So the zinc will help shut down that RNA polymerase that makes more RNA for the virus. But it can't get into the cell. It's a charged ion. So you need chemicals to get it in there. And those chemicals are sometimes drugs and sometimes uh, supplements or naturally occurring chemicals. And we'll mention quercetin, N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. Hydroxychloroquine does that. And uh, uh, there are some other things that do that as well. So they help zinc get into the cell to do its job, because zinc can't do it by itself. Um, I think that helps too. I can't remember for sure. If anybody knows. Yeah, let's wait for till the end for a question. Sorry. Let me say one more thing on zinc. Be cautious on zinc. You know, when you use natural things, you still got to use horse sense, you know? Um, zinc, if you're not careful can to bleach your copper, when you're getting up in even 40 milligrams, you'll see copper added to it, say three to five milligrams of copper. Getting into 50, and folks are taking 100 milligrams of zinc a day. There's a physician over in Sevier County. She has her staff take over 200 milligrams a day. Be careful on taking a lot of zinc because it can deplete your copper. Your body has um, places in your gut that let minerals in. And if one mineral overwhelms the other, then you may get deficient in absorption of, of the minerals that are not uh, prominent in your diet. Vitamin C. 40 milligrams of zinc per day. Vitamin C is one of the largest immune system booters, boosters of all. In fact, lack of vitamin C can even make, your, make you more prone to getting sick. Foods rich in vitamin C, guava, kiwi, and did you know that this cap of a strawberry has no more vitamin C than an orange does? So when you make your smoothie and you throw in your strawberries, leave those caps on because they've got a lot of vitamin C in them. Oranges, broccoli, kale, and, and strawberries also themselves have uh, vitamin C, but the cap, the green cap, has more vitamin C than the strawberry does. Daily intake of vitamin C is essential for good health because your body doesn't produce or store it. Again, remember vitamin C has a half-life of 30 minutes. B6. B, uh, vitamin B6 is vital to supporting biochemical reactions to the immune system. B6 is found in green vegetables, chickpeas. Vitamin E. Vitamin E is a powerful antioxidant that helps the body fight off infection. Foods rich in vitamin E include nuts, seeds, and spinach. But be careful with your vitamin E foods. Do not freeze them. Do not freeze your vitamin E foods because, let's say you have a bag of almonds, when you freeze it, it significantly reduces the vitamin E in, the, in that food. Elderberries. Elderberry inhibits an early stage, uh, inhibits the early stage stages of an infection by blocking key viral proteins responsible for both the viral attachment and entry into the host cells. How many of y'all grown up with elderberry here? I grew up with it. It's in the mountains. Uh, the phytochemicals from the elderberry juice were shown to be effective at stopping the virus infecting the cells. However, to the surprise of the researchers, they were even more effective at inhibiting viral propagation at later stages of the influenza cycle when the cells had already been infected with the virus. This observation was quite surprising and rather significant because the blocking of the viral cycle at several stages has a higher chance of inhibiting the viral infection. Astragalus, the broad array of immune stimulating characteristics of astragalus have been widely used in treating patients with both acute and chronic infections, including viral uh, uh, myocarditis and viral hepatitis. 
Stragos has demonstrated immune potential uh, pro pro potentiating uh, uh, effects in human animals and in vitro studies and is often used as an adjunct uh, therapy with HIV positive persons and those with AIDS. And here is, this is from the PDR. Uh, if you have a question on, on astragalus, here are some dosing. Anything on astragalus? Echinacea. Echinacea prepare, uh, uh, preparations are commonly given in Europe for the pro uh, prophylaxis or treatment of bacterial and viral infections and as an adjunct treatment to more severe infections. Echinacea extracts are commonly used to treat upper respiratory infections, influenza-like infections, and are reported to significantly reduce the symptoms accompanying uh, uh, the common cold. But as you use echinacea, just as you would use golden seal, remember to only use it for two weeks. Stop for two weeks and then start. Don't use echinacea long-term uh, or golden seal long-term. Iron, iron, natural antiviral, antifungal, antibiotic, Iodine was the most of, go ahead. Iodine. <laughs> what did I say? Iron, oh, thank you, iodine. Iodine was the most effective agent for killing viruses, especially influenza viruses. Uh, aerosol iodine was also found to kill viruses in sprayed mist, and solutions of iodine were equally effective. And so I know a lot of folks have talked about sprays, but the, um, the, uh, you can either do solutions or the, the uh, tablets are also very effective. You think what iodine? NAC, you want to talk about NAC? NAC has some data behind it. It's been shown that people who take NAC in the past who had research done on them uh, had the tendency to still get the flu, for example, but they had a much milder case. And NAC has been used to treat Tylenol overdose to keep the liver from failing from the toxin produced by the acetaminophen, which is what Tylenol is. And Dr. Schwell talks about some studies recently in New York where the NAC was used at doses anywhere from 600 milligrams twice a day IV to even 30,000 milligrams a day in divided doses. And they were used for patients with uh, G6PD deficiency, which means they tended to rupture their blood cells if they had too much uh, uh, stress or, or high dose vitamin C or uh, other reasons. So the NAC would decrease the immune uh, activation that was overwhelming them in COVID-19. It would decrease the uh, in inflammation to a great deal, and the C-reactive protein would come way down within about 24 hours or so. And they stopped it, and the C-reactive protein would go up again, and the hemolysis, the rupture of blood cells would go up again. So they could see that it did have a powerful effect in decreasing inflammation. And it is one of the ones I just mentioned a couple of times as helping zinc get into the cells to inhibit the, the reproduction of the virus. Uh, it, I don't know how safe it is long term, so if you do take it, you probably shouldn't take it for years. You should just take it uh, seasonally or maybe even um, shorter than that. And the last item we have is rocket fuel. Who's ever had rocket fuel? We're going to hand those out at the very end. Uh, or whatever you want to do handing out, but uh, I encourage you, try some rocket fuel. It's amazing. Uh, it's just some simple things you have in the kitchen cabinet that can uh, build your immune system. The ones on the left are the original rocket fuel. I've added a couple items on the right, but even if you do just the items on the left, it's extremely effective. Uh, the last thing I want to say before Arvo finishes here is just we can talk about what to take. But the most important thing is, what do you do? Um, you know, stay away from stress. Get your sleep. Um, in this time of year, stay away from sugar. And if you are sick, don't drink orange juice like we used to do. Uh, you know, orange juice, who, out, who knows when that was juiced and is the, you know, has the vitamin C oxidized. It's got a lot of fructose, fruit juice does. And so be careful, be proactive in taking care of yourselves. Uh, you've seen a number of things mentioned tonight. Um, I don't know how important it is to take all of them, but you should choose some things, get accustomed to them, learn about them, and look up drug interactions with certain supplements, such as you know maybe vitamin C or high-dose garlic, 
if you're uh, on anticoagulant medication, you need to be careful. Remember, if you take a huge antioxidant load with uh, vitamin C and oregano oil and garlic and all that stuff, you don't want to do it every day because you can affect your medications and make them less effective. So you may want to separate those doses from your medications by several hours so that you don't have a, a bad effect on your medications. Um, I mentioned several times, look up MedCram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M, MedCram. This is for medical students and doctors in training, but it also has all the COVID-19 lectures that Dr. Schwelt produced. Roger uh, Schwelt is S-E-H-E-U-L-T, but just look up his website. And so he has lectures like vitamin D and COVID-19. He has lectures on the vaccines. He has lectures on uh, 10 things to do if you get sick. He tells about what he takes in, uh, I think it's lecture 59. He tells about the doses of, and what he takes to prevent infection and, and the physical measures he does as well. So there's a lot of good information on his website alone to help you. And then um, you can go visit Walt at his uh, facility and he'll talk to you too. He has a wealth of information which we physicians don't learn except with great effort uh, because we're so busy. So uh, I think we'll end it there. And so would you like to have prayer first or have the question answer first? Okay. So let's open it up to questions. We'll give five minutes or so. Yes, that's what I understand. Medcram.com. Um, any questions? Can't see you very well, so, oh, okay, Pam? Well, vitamin D you want to take with a meal because it's fat soluble. I think a lot of the supplements, I guess I don't know, but I would think it'd be just as well to take them with a meal. Most are with meals. Some are, it will say on the, on the bottle, some things you do want to take on an empty stomach, but a lot of them we take with a meal. Um, I take a special form of vitamin C called liposomal vitamin C. It's wrapped in lipid, so you're supposed to take it 10 or 15 minutes before a meal so that you get the benefit of the... Uh, uh, a head start on this, but it's got to be near a meal to get the best absorption. So you, you kind of have to read the label, I think. I think Walt can answer that. In regard to vitamin C, it does. Uh, you can only absorb so much at a time or you'll get bloating and diarrhea. It, it depends, and, and as just as Arvo said, you, some you want in divided doses, uh, like vitamin C, and even the elderberry, and, and a lot of them I like breaking up throughout the day. It's like drinking water. You don't drink all your water at one time. And so if you can break it up a lot of times throughout the day, you, ha you have better absorption and, and you're not uh, you know, just throwing it off. Most uh, drugs are taken more than once a day too, but I, I can't tell you for each specific supplement. Go ahead. That's correct. Helps it work better too. Yeah. Uh, it was asked, do we need to take magnesium with the vitamin D? Uh, and yes, uh, it is helpful to take them together. I don't think it's just absorption, but that's part of the issue. And uh, Walt was saying he had a patient that did not get adequate vitamin D levels without taking magnesium, even at high doses. Yes? Yes, I did mention that. Um, 
Dr. Nelson is reminding us to be careful what we take with our blood thinners. So as vitamin C and garlic, for example, can affect your blood thinning and maybe increase it more than you would want so that you can bleed easier. Okay, rocket fuel we use if a person feels like they're getting sick and you want to drink the whole thing within 30 minutes to an hour. Um, it, um, it does. I, I, I was channel, who's the one that does live at five in Knoxville? And I had him drink it and I, he went moving. I thought he was going to fall off the back of the stage when he drank his, his drink of it. Uh, it's powerful, it is. But uh, it's used for if you feel like you're catching something to build your immune system. Well, some people will do it just to keep their immune system up. I'm more of a, I use it more if I feel like I'm catching something. Uh, it's probably pretty expensive, some of these things like elderberry juice and yes. Alamed, they're not cheap. You won't be doing it too often. Is there another question? Cindy. It is not up yet. Um, thank you, Cindy. We're doing a program. We usually do a program at the mustard seed at the beginning of each year, which Cindy's helped us before at those. Uh, this year we're doing it on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash mustard seed TN, mustard seed TN. It started last Monday. It's for just 15 minutes each day. And if you wanted to go through a lifestyle kind of program, it's very, what do you need to do? Um, and you can catch up with it. But it's Mustard Seed TN on Facebook. We are trying to upload it to Facebook. I'm, I'm, Carson's coming in this weekend to help me with that. Um, so I encourage you to come there. I'll mention something before you question. There's a website that Dr. Nelson sent to me, FLCCC Alliance. F is in Frank, LCCC Alliance. And... Uh, it mentions Dr. Corey, who testified before the Senate Committee on Ivermectin, which you probably heard about, or some of you have. Um, this website is called COVID19CriticalCare.com, and this is a group of doctors, including some at the East Virginia Medical School, who have put together a whole protocol for outpatient treatment of COVID-19 and inpatient treatment, and they have a very low mortality rate in their uh, ICU, in their hospital. And this is in Norfolk, Virginia. So you may want to look this website up if you want to know what these doctors recommend if you get sick with uh, COVID or how to prevent it. COVID19criticalcare.com. And they have downloadable uh, files. Yes. It's a pro-inflammatory state that has resulted... The question is, what is a cytokine storm for <clears throat> our yes, listeners? I'm sorry. A cytokine storm is a pro-inflammatory state that results from a delayed immune response. So the virus is almost gone or already gone, and the inflammation that's produced has no way to settle back down quickly, and that's why they have to give steroids. And it damages tissues, damages the lungs, it causes organ failure and uh, can cause death because of that uh, overwhelming inflammatory response. And it's, I don't know all the details, I'm not an ICU doctor, but it, it involves just an overactivation of the immune system that is uncontrolled. And so when they were thinking of giving steroids, they thought, well, you might cause a problem. But once they found out that COVID-19 was a two-stage disease, that you have the infection first, and then you have, in the severe cases, you have the inflammatory response later with increased clotting even more than at first, then they knew that steroids actually were appropriate once they convinced themselves of the appropriate studies. So giving these antibodies and other things, and even hydroxychloroquine late in the disease is probably useless because the virus is gone. So you need to fight the inflammation. And it also has something to do with the uh, 
long-term, uh, the long haulers in COVID-19. They feel bad for a while. Some of these patients, they give steroids by mouth to settle things down, and they feel better too. I can't recommend anything, but you can just ask your doctor uh, if any of you get that or have relatives with that to, to see if there's inflammation. They can measure your blood tests and see if you have excessive inflammation in your body. Okay, I guess that's about it. Again, thank you everyone for coming to the program tonight. And thank you Walt and Arvo for that. That was extremely informative. Everyone should have received um, this when you came in, this flyer. I want to tell you about this. This is a freebie. We usually uh, like to do some follow-up um, programs with some of our Dinner with the Doctor uh, presentations, and this is one that we're going to do on stress. Again, um, talking about how it, stress affects your immune system. Now, it does say on here that it's February 2020, and if that's true, we are very late. But um, that's, we're not used to writing 2021 yet. Anyway, it's next month, actually a month from today, probably. And um, so I would like you to put this on your calendar, and you're welcome to come. Walt Cross will be presenting that. Don't forget to get the uh, handout on the rocket fuel. Um, if you didn't get it, or you won't pass it all around, okay. So again, thank you for coming, and um, we will see you February 9, okay? And um, my husband will have a prayer before you go. Please bow your heads. Dear Father, we thank you that you have given laws that we can learn and remedies that we can use. And may we be motivated to follow them and to help our friends and our loved ones to follow them and, and be able to help them too. Thank you for protecting us. We know that we have lost many in this pandemic and we pray for wisdom and for uh, strength and for courage, whatever comes in the future. We thank you for your promises and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget to take your lunch for tomorrow. It's too late to eat it tonight. <laughs>